guys? Love you. How you guys doing? Doing good. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off, shall we? We're talking about ossification. And uh, so we kind of started talking about intramembranous ossification, the different types of ossification, the formation of the fontanelles. Um, and so when you kind of take a look at this, kind of like the review uh, of what we we're looking at. And so when you take a look at intramembranous ossification, this is uh, really kind of a good view uh, histologically. Um, of it. And so a couple of things you can see here, first of all, is you can locate the osteocytes here inside what's already starting to become their little lacuna on the outer edge of this structure. You can see the osteoblasts. So these guys are laying down new bony matrix, which is basically all the pink stuff in the middle. So you can already see that the Osteoblasts are basically kind of laying down layers of matrix and they're already starting to trap osteocytes, which will then become mature osteocytes inside their lacuna, basically um, maintaining the bony matrix. And so this is basically kind of how you're building, in this case, a trabecula. This is kind of the cartoonized version um, of it. So you can see on the periphery, you basically have all your osteoblasts laying down bony matrix, trapping its fellow bone cells in the middle of that bony matrix. And then that bony matrix will ultimately become, in this particular case, if we're making um, spongy bone, in this particular case, this will become a trabeculum um, of, of bone. And so typically in embryology, especially when you're doing intramembranous ossification, um, the some of the mesenchymal cells, not all of them, but some of them will uh, differentiate. And so they'll differentiate into, we talked about this before, a few slides um, ago, last time we talked about it. So these mesenchymal cells, which are a fundamental embryological cell that's uh, responsible for laying down new tissue, these guys will differentiate into that stem cell population that we are familiar with when it comes to building and repairing bone matrix, those osteochondral progenitor cells, which will become the progenitor cells for the, the chondrocytes and also the progenitor cells for the osteocytes as well. And so this is basically where that osteoblast and chondroblast lineage comes from, is from this original progenitor cell, which is a descendant of these original embryonic cells, these mesenchymal cells during embryology. So generally speaking, what happens is when you're forming your bone matrix, you're surrounding yourself um, with the things that we associate with in extracellular matrix. So you're looking at, say, for instance, surrounding yourself with collagen fibers um, of the actual membrane itself. Because remember, we mentioned before, you're actually making this in the middle of connective tissue, right? So you have collagenous fibers, you start laying down that matrix. Um, and then ultimately, these blast cells will mature into osteocytes. And at that point you've grown up and now it's your turn to basically maintain the bony matrix at that particular point. And so ultimately what will happen from that as you kind of start to advance outward. So as you start to lay down your bony matrix, you start to advance outward and this becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually you get uh, an actual trabeculum of woven bone. And so spongy bone formation is uh, basically, so when you have this kind of the beginning of it, right? So you just begin this little nucleus of ossification. Now with the development of spongy bone, um, you still have your osteoblasts kind of on the surface. So you notice what's happened here is you basically have the outgrowth of that original center. So instead of just your bone matrix being kind of like a, a, a center, you start to advance outward. And you start to kind of lay it down with, with some training in there. Um, and then what happens is you start to create this kind of that sort of spongy looking structure with your trajectory, which will actually like the the osteocytes have inside of them are starting to perform. And so within these little bits of training then, as your osteoblast laying down your bone matrix, you have things like the invasion and the intrusion of blood vessels and things of that nature as they kind of 
weave into those little nooks and crannies of the spongy bone. But basically you have all the components that you need in order to grow out this bone, right? So you're basically laying down layer after layer after layer of bony matrix as it starts to uh, move outward. And this is kind of like the beginning of the trabeculum as you kind of start to extend it. And this is kind of what it looks like histologically. So basically all of this material is all the bony matrix. And if you look very closely, you can see those little cells right here on the periphery. Those are your osteoblasts laying down new layers of matrix, basically right on top of, of essentially where they are. And so this will kind of start to get a little thicker and thicker and thicker um, until ultimately you finish out the process of making that spongy bone. Of course, all these trabecula will start to grow together. And then, and that's an easy process, right? Because if I've got like a little island of bone out here, a little island of bone out here, I've got osteoblasts on either side that's basically laying it down. All they basically do is just pretty much they run into each other and they just kind of fill in the gap. And then basically that becomes a continuous trabeculum essentially. And so that's kind of how it starts. And then of course, um, the compact bone formation is the next piece. So ultimately then once you kind of get this, this is kind of more of a mature uh, look because now you can see there's a couple of pieces that are in place now. So first of all, you can see the spongy component of the spongy bone. Um, but now what you can see is the osteoblast have now become the inner cellular layer of this connective tissue periosteum that's now starting to form on the outside. So you can see now how you can start to, from this intramembranous ossification pattern, you start to slowly grow outward as you lay down bony matrix. And then the layer of osteoblast cells will then ultimately form what will become the cell layer of the periosteum. And then what happens is the connective tissue starts to develop outside of those osteoblasts so that that can create that connective tissue outer layer of the, of the periosteum. And then you can start to see, you get your periosteum proper. So that's kind of like um, ultimately how you kind of put together this piece, starting from, first of all, just that very, very nucleation, that, that initial event of laying down bony matrix and just basically growing out from there and kind of organizing the pattern with which you lay it down, connecting your trabecula together, and then eventually building out to your periosteum. So that's all intramembranous ossification. Okay, now that's all well and good, but that only really accounts for the flat bones and the irregular bones, right? So those are typically the ones that will kind of happen in the middle of connective tissue. You start laying down body matrix in the middle of connective tissue. But most of your bones and a good chunk of your skeleton, especially the load-bearing portion of your skeleton, what we would normally think of as the bones that we typically break all the time, these are been, have, have been formed by the second pattern of ossification. That's endochondral ossification. So... Some parts of your skull do do endochondral. For instance, uh, not all the mandible, but parts of the mandible um, will be formed through endochondral ossification. Um, most of the other bones beyond that are going to be uh, mostly endochondral as well. So what does that mean? So endo means inside. Chondral is cartilage. So an endochondral means inside the cartilage, basically, is what that means. And so basically when we're fetal and in our fetal development stage, around the fourth week or so of development, essentially our skeletons are made out of cartilage. We start with a cartilaginous skeleton. So now remember the reason why that's important is because if you can manage to lay down some form of connective tissue, whether it's like dense irregular connective tissue, like we saw with intramembranous ossification or cartilage, in this particular case, it's easy to convert from one connective tissue to another, right? And so we talked a little bit about that ease of kind of like connecting 
two connective tissues together by weaving together the collagenous fibers. And so we start with cartilage, which is good because that gives us a good start. And then what happened afterwards about maybe uh, a little deeper, a couple of months in, we're looking at ossification beginning. And so we start off with, just like we did before, a nucleation point, right? A starting point called an ossification center. And so that begins the growth of our skeleton, which actually continues until we're in our late teens, um, mostly some early 20s, if you continue to grow after the age of 18. But ultimately, um, some of this stuff, all of our cartilage is slowly converted over. And so um, some of it will terminate earlier than others, but this is basically how it goes. Roughly your cartilage for the first eight-ish or so weeks of development. Around week nine, you're still embryonic, you're in your embryonic stage. What starts to happen is um, you start to create a bit of a perichondrium. Remember, it's perichondrium because it's cartilage at this point. It's not periosteum at this point. And so the important thing to kind of highlight and to understand here is when you're first starting this off, your mesenchymal cells, remember those are those embryonic cells that kind of gets the whole ball rolling in this sense. These guys are gonna be differentiating into your osteochondral progenitor cells. Remember these are the guys that are the ones that are in that perichondrium and the periosteum that it gives rise to the osteoblasts and the chondroblasts, right? So these are like our terminal stem cells. And these guys in particular, at this particular stage, will turn into chondroblasts. And so the chondroblasts will start um, basically laying down the um, hyaline cartilage. And that'll basically kind of form the shape of essentially where the bone is gonna be. So essentially the cartilage is going to be kind of like a, a kind of a crude sort of a sketch out, if you will, of your skeleton that will essentially be replaced with bone and it gets a little bit bigger, right? So this is kind of like your sketched out plans. Like if you're thinking in terms of being an artist, an artist oftentimes will kind of sketch out the basic picture on the canvas and that'll kind of be their guide to basically sort of fill out the rest of the picture. So one of the things that happens is in the cartilage model, you have your perichondria, which starts to form around the periphery of the cartilage itself. So here you can see kind of the layer of the perichondrium basically starting to wrap itself around the cartilaginous model. So what you're doing now is you're basically organizing now your, your new uh, matrix uh, deposition into this perichondrial layering type of a strategy, right? So you're already starting to set that pattern up that you lay down new stuff um, by putting your membrane on there. As you get to the third month, then what happens is you have to start forming a bony collar. So this is where your center of ossification comes in. So your center of ossification begins, first of all, in what's going to become the diaphysis as that sort of extends out and lengthens out in terms of the, the bone. Once you actually have a perichondrium, because the perichondrium and the periosteum are so close together in structure, really the fundamental difference between the two is that one is giving rise to chondroblasts and the other one's giving rise to osteoblasts. It is an easy conversion from periosteum or from perichondrium to periosteum. Literally all you do is you switch to osteoblasts. That's an easy do, right? Because already you've got your osteoprogenitor cells already in the perichondrium. All they have to do now is basically become chondroblasts, I mean, excuse me, osteoblasts instead of chondroblasts. That happens right here in the middle where they start to lay down osteoblasts in this middle portion. Now, the important thing is what seems to be the trigger in all of this, this ossification process is the calcification of cartilage. So the first thing that happens is the cartilage becomes calcified.
And what that does is it basically triggers the formation of the first ossification center right here in the diaphysis. So then what happens is typically calcified cartilage gets replaced. So this is what osteoblasts go after. So osteoblasts then, once they actually calcify the cartilage, what's gonna happen is um, this cartilaginous matrix typically is going to be um, absorbed and then um, enlarged. And then ultimately what's gonna happen is the osteoblast, once it's cal calcified, is going to replace that with bony matrix. So here you can see the range, the zone of calcified cartilage. Once that's calcified, then the osteoblasts start to replace calcified cartilage with the bony matrix. And as a result, as it starts to slowly replace that, you start to create this little bony collar, this edge piece made out of bone. That's the beginning. So what you have now is a liner that looks less like perichondrium and a little more like periosteum. And that's gonna be important because that's what you need in order to grow. So in addition to that, you also have uh, blood vessels that are actually coming in to feed these osteoblasts as they basically sort of move inward. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna just basically start laying down layer after layer after layer, and they're gonna basically start moving inward like that, okay? Not all the way in, but inward. And that's gonna start this ossification component. So as we kind of advance, you can see that now the periosteum has really started to sort of take hold. It's really started to remodel this bony collar. So you have your little bony collar right here. That's gonna be the region of compact bone in your long bone. This is your primary ossification center. The blood vessel that was supplying the osteoblast has now invaded the inner portion of that um, calcified, that region of calcified cartilage has now been replaced by bone. So you can see how the inside portion has been cleared out and is getting cleared out. It's turning into spongy bone at first, and then eventually that'll start to move into and become the medullary cavity, that open cavity that's inside the diaphysis of long bones. You can see here, however, you've got basically this kind of two front war, right? So now that the bone has moved in and sort of claimed the middle, the portion of the bone, now it's kind of fighting a two front war. It's busy converting this region right here, this interface between bone matrix and cartilaginous matrix, it's converting that calcified cartilage into bony matrix. And so now what's happening is it's taking layers and it's adding the layers like this. And it's starting to advance this direction and it's advancing this direction. And so your calcified cartilage area is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's basically being replaced by this bony structure, part of which has a bony collar on it. That's our compact bone edges with spongy bone that's getting cleared out in the middle. So this is basically what's happening. Up here, where you would have the epiphysis, you still have uncalcified cartilage, but not for long. Because after you start advancing your primary ossification center to both tips of the long bone, what happens is you create a second ossification center. So now you're really fighting. It's, I guess this is a forefront war now, right? So you've got four fronts now. So what happens is it starts the same way, right? So you basically in the middle of your calcified, uncalcified cartilage, your cartilage will calcify. So if you take a look at this, the one step before this, what you saw was up here in your uncalcified cartilage, what you found was an area that becomes calcified. As a result, that's fair game. That seems to signal the osteoblast to come in and invade. 
right? It's like opening up the door to the invader. Notice you get blood vessel intrusion. Why? Because you've got bone cells that are doing all this work. They need to eat too, right? So then what happens is you notice that you basically get the same ossification pattern where your osteoblast basically will start laying down bony matrix. And as it lays down that bony matrix, it creates a little hard bony edge to it with a little bit of spongy bone in the middle. Um, and then it starts to advance in this direction, in all directions actually, filling out the calcified cartilage. So wherever that cartilage is being calcified, that's where the bone will come in and replace it, okay? So you'll see that the secondary ossification center is moving outward in all directions. It's gonna collide with the advancing front of the first ossification center at some point. But then eventually you're gonna run out of cartilage, right? So you can't convert it all to bone, but this is important because also at this particular point, as the diaphysis has continued to develop, you can see you've cleaned out that medullary cavity now. So there's not a lot of spongy bone in there. You clean that out. Typically, whenever you're cleaning that out because you laid down an initial bony matrix and now you're kind of cleaning out those spongy trabecula, that's usually the activity of osteoclast doing that. Okay, so that's part of that remodeling piece. You can see your periosteum, periosteum has advanced along with the advancing bony front, right? The front of the, of the bone development. So then once you do this, then you come to your last little bit where you run out of cartilage and then you have to stop because there's no more calcified cartilage for you to work with. And so this is basically where we get to our mature bone. So this is your adult bone. Um, and so you can see you've got your articular cartilage, which is kind of like the last vestige of your embryonic cartilage. That's your articular cartilage. So um, then, of course, you have your spongy bone and what was your secondary ossification center. And then you have the last bit of spongy bone in the upper portion of your primary ossification center. And then of course your medullary cavity, which is then cleaned out and that bony collar then becomes the compact bone associated with the edges of the long bone. Now, what about the cartilage that was being sandwiched between secondary and primary ossification centers? Well, that's basically what this guy's, guy's right here. This is your epiphyseal line, which has been converted all to bone now. And so this is a completed growth pattern. There's no more growth going on here uh, from this point on. So, sorry, that's just me and my obsessive compulsive, also making sure I hit all the right buttons. So that's basically endochondral ossification. So then what happens then is that's happening from, you know, those first few months pretty much all the way through your entire life. Now, you have considerably more bone, obviously, at birth than you did at three months um, of development. And you still have a lot of cartilage in your skeleton, even up to puberty. As a matter of fact, your knuckles are mostly cartilage until you reach your puberty, right? So your knuckles haven't grown in. Those big, gnarly knuckles that we associate with knocking somebody out with, those don't really set in until you hit puberty. So most of that is actually cartilaginous, which is the reason why if you haven't hit puberty yet, it's not a good idea to go into a good old fashioned fist throwing kind of a fight, right? So if you're a kid, just do the wrestling thing, right? You'll, you'll make the point with wrestling because otherwise you're just gonna trash your cartilage and good luck with that, right? Wait until those bones grow in and then go after them and take your vengeance, right? Where they say vengeance is best served cold. That'd be very cold, right? So like, remember back when we were five, right? And you just give them a pair of sandwiches, nice knuckle sandwiches. Okay, so, but bone growth continues, right? So after birth, it continues going on. And so typically when you take a look at bone growth, there's a couple of ways you can grow, right? So first of all, you can either grow in length, right? That's basically lengthening out, especially like your femur or you can grow in girth. Now, 
Now, there's less growth in girth because you don't need a lot of girth. Girth being circumferential growth, right? Width, the width of your diameter of your femur, say, for instance, right? The one thing to remember is when your bones are growing, you're only going to be growing as much as you need, not more. So if your bones reach a diameter where you can comfortably handle all the load that you need to on your body, your body weight, then your bones aren't interested in growing anymore because to do so would literally be a waste of energy and a waste of materials, right? So you don't get brownie points. There's no competitions for bone building the way there are for muscle building, right? So if you can, if your bones can do the job, you go for the smallest bone possible to do the job because it's expensive to make bone. And so ultimately, whenever you're growing in length in particular, you're going to be growing at the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. And so this will... Um, involve a couple of different growth patterns. First of all, um, you have interstitial growth. And we'll take a look at that here in just a second. And you have appositional growth right on the surface of the cartilage. Interstitial basically means inside the cartilage. Appositional means um, to be opposed to something is to, meet, to be next to it. Um, to opposite yourself is to put yourself next to something. Um, and so in this case, you're basically putting yourself next to the surface of the cartilage. And so it grows from the surface out. Then what happens is once the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate becomes ossified, it becomes an epiphyseal line, basically bone. Um, for some of us who are incredibly unlucky, that process will happen when we're 12. I can't imagine. I don't think I've ever met a 12-year-old whose epiphyseal plate was completely ossified. Um, usually you're actively growing at that point. But it does happen from time to time. It goes as late as 25. Probably the overwhelming average is probably somewhere in the late teens, the mid to late teens. It depends um, on the individual. Sometimes it also depends on gender. I think females tend to stop growing sooner than males. I think they start growing sooner, but then they stop growing sooner. And the males kind of keep growing um, into their later teens. So the one piece that is not ossified is your articular cartilage. So that basically is uh, basic de designed to cover your bones and protect them. Um, and ultimately, they will get on my screen here. They will basically experience appositional growth at that particular point. So not within, but outside of. Um, uh, because in order to, to go inside, it essentially the matrix, you'd have to break up the matrix because at that point, the matrix is solid. So you can't really do anything inside. There's nothing inside to start with because it's all basically solid. Um, and so this typically will happen um, on either like an old bone or that's being repaired or something of that nature or like a cartilaginous surface. So you're limited in what you can do as you get deeper and deeper and deeper into your bone formation. So let's take a look at the epiphyseal plate because the epiphyseal plate has, has a couple of different zones to it. So basically, when you take a look, these are all reproductions. So these guys here, you recall these guys here. So the new stuff is here at the bottom. So the epiphyseal plate is this guy right here. And so what happens is this is constantly being, re uh, being replaced with bony tissue as your primary ossification center continues to move forward. Now, what happens is in order to maintain growth, that little strip of cartilage has to keep replenishing itself. So if you can manage to add new cartilage to this epiphyseal line, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna give the bone a new layer to ossify and it's gonna basically force that bone to grow longer because you're adding another layer of bone to it. And so this is basically how it works. So you have a couple of different types of zones associated with 
your oops here with the epiphyseal plate. The first one we're going to take a look at is what's called the zone of resting cartilage. So this is basically where you have slowly dividing chondrocytes. Basically, it's uh, it's kind of at rest, right? So these are happy little chondrocytes, and this typically is going to be right up here in this upper region. So if you take a look at it closely, you'll notice it looks very similar to the kind of hyaline cartilage that we've been seeing in our histology slides, right? Chondrocytes that are trapped inside their lacuna amidst the kind of a glassy sea of hyaline cartilage. That's kind of pretty typical of what we've seen. But then what happens is we go to the next zone, which is the zone of proliferation. This is basically um, where you have new cartilage being formed <clears throat> because the chondrocytes divide and they form stacks of cells. So you're adding a new layer. of chondrocytes to the epiphyseal side. of the plate. So let's take a look at that. So that's basically this piece right here. So if you take a look, close look, you can see they have very, very tiny cells. It's basically typified by tiny little cells, but there's a lot of them. So that's basically typical of a group of cells that are dividing quickly and that are going through their cell cycle very fast, right? So their cell cycle the beginning of which is G1, that's their growth phase, right? So if you don't go through your whole growth phase, then you're not gonna become big, like a big, normal, large, full adult sized cell. If you sort of truncate that growth phase and you go right into the next round of cell cycle, then what you're gonna be is you're gonna be a little cell that produces little daughter cells that then produces little daughter cells. And so you see this accumulation of small cells. That's a pretty typical path of, uh, pathological. That's a pretty typical um, pathology landmark uh, for cells that are highly or actively or quickly dividing. And they're dividing without going through their full cell cycle, growing up completely. Okay, so that's your zone of proliferation. And what you're doing is you're adding material to this side. The next one is what's called design of the zone of hypertrophy. So this is basically where the chondrocytes mature and they enlarge and they create large lacunae. So that's this next piece down here in zone three. So you can see just how big these now lacuna are. So you can see these like gigantic cells in there with these little chondrocytes, so there's really, really big cells now. So that's your zone of hypertrophy. Um, and then the next piece is going to be the trigger, your zone of calcification. Remember calcification of cartilage is the trigger. So your, your chondrocytes, your cartilaginous matrix is calcified. That triggers or signals osteoblast to replace with bone. At this point as well, there's a death zone in here. The zone of calcification is also the dead zone. So once the matrix calcifies, those uh, chondrocytes in there die and then they evacuate that space. So if you take a look down here at the periphery, this zone of calcification what you see here is basically large open cells. You can actually see them at the bottom end of the hypertrophy. See these large white cells here that are empty? That's, those, that's basically in the zone of calcification. There's no cell in there. The cells died and it's left behind that little cavity. But that little cavity is now surrounded by calcified matrix. And now we know from the endochondral pattern that calcification of cartilage is the trigger, it's the red flag for ossification. And then the last zone is gonna be the ossification zone. 
This is uh, where the cartilage on the diaphysial side, not on the epiphysial side, is basically going to come in. It's going to get dissolved and replaced by bony matrix. And that's what's happening down here in this bottom portion. So if you take a look down here, the bony matrix typically is in pink. So you can see this kind of pink uh, residue that's being laid down. That's going to be the bony matrix. So all this is bony matrix being laid down. So if you want to take a look at the cartoonized version, you can see basically you have the same thing here. So here's your, your zone of resting cartilage up here with your zone of proliferation. So you can see you have lots of little cells in there because they've been dividing. And what's happening is they're adding to this layer here. So you're kind of maintaining this piece here. So you're adding a new layer to the epiphyseal side. And then underneath that, you're gonna have your zone of hypertrophy. And then underneath that is gonna be your death zone. That's gonna be your calcification zone because you see your empty lacuna in here. Basically, they are just left behind cavities. And then here you can see the osteoblasts uh, are starting to come in and fill this up. And then what they do is they basically replace with bony matrix. So what's happened then is this layer right here, which you didn't have before, this becomes a new layer of bone. So guess what you just did to the length of your bone? You just added a new layer to it. And then what happens? You do it all over again, right? So you add a new layer of chondrocytes on the epiphyseal side to keep that cartilage replaced, to keep replacing it. And then that bottom level that's down there in the zone of ossification will then get broken down and replaced by bone and you'll have added another layer of bone. And then as you continue to replace on the cartilaginous side, on the epiphyseal side, that new cartilage in the plate, then you constantly have an endless source of new cartilage to calcify and to replace with bone. Until of course you don't, which happens when you stop growing. Because at some point what happens is your growth hormones, and these are all driven by growth hormones. Um, so what happens is your growth hormones will stop being produced by your pituitary. And then the signal that's telling these chondrocytes to divide and to replace the cartilage in the epiphyseal side in that, in that epiphyseal plate stops dividing. And then eventually what happens is the bone, the bony matrix continues to add layer to layer to layer, but you're not replacing it up here at the top by the epiphyseal plate. And eventually what happens is that bone will catch up to that periphery of the epiphyseal plate. It will consume the um, calcified layer, then it will that slowly encroach on the hypertrophy layer, and then it'll slowly encroach on um, the proliferation layer, and then it'll finally get to the area of resting cartilage. And then finally, it'll overtake the resting cartilage, and it'll fill all of that cartilaginous piece in the plate with bone, and that's when it becomes an epiphyseal line. And that's when we stop growing because we don't have any more cartilage left to divide. It's all been converted to bone. So your growth hormone in and around your late teens or so just simply stops being made. And there's, that's, a, that's an endocrine thing. That, you'll get that in AMP too, right? So there's a complex signaling system as you're growing that basically tells the pituitary, okay, we've reached max height. We're good. Shut it down. It shuts down growth hormone production from your pituitary, and then your bones will finally fill in the rest of that cartilage. And at that point, you're your full height. Um, technically, you can, but you have to do it before your epiphyseal plate fills in. Once your epiphyseal plate turns into bone, there's, there's, your, it's done. It's like, uh, you know, like those old tales of Medusa. You know, it's like you've been turned into stone, and there's no coming back for that. 
parasite. But if you still have an epiphyseal plate and you take and extend growth hormone, technically you can maintain that and continue to grow technically indefinitely. Okay. That's kind of what happens with pituitary gigantism is you get a tumor on the pituitary that produces an abnormal amount of growth hormone and it doesn't stop because it's driven now by a, a, a tumor instead of listening to the regulation in your body that would normally shut that growth hormone down. So as a result, you're constantly making what's called constitutive or continuous growth hormone well beyond your years when you should have stopped producing growth hormone. And as a result, we get these gigantic uh, people who are like nine, 10 feet tall. I mean, it's like, and if you take a look at them, their bodies are a wreck because one of the reasons why you cut off growth hormone is because your body realizes that there's kind of a rate of diminishing returns at some point that you get big, but then if you continue to get bigger, then it's actually not going to become an asset. It's going to start to become a liability because at some point, like cardiovascularly, your cardiovascular system was not designed to support a nine, 10 foot frame, right? So you start to suffer that way. Your joints were not designed to carry that much of body, that much body weight um, on your joints. And so you start to have lots of joint problems. That's the reason why a lot of times those really tall, you always see pictures of them, right? Like the super tall eight, nine foot guy who's like a pituitary giant. They're, they're always like leaning over on a cane and they're not just like on a cane. I mean, literally they're like leaning on a cane. Like that's the only thing keeping them upright. Um, that's because at some point their body just doesn't function properly because it's, it's growing disproportionately. So what about the articular surface, right? So the epiphysis will grow um, in size. Basically, that's only going to be at that articular surface where that articular cartilage is. Um, and so when you have this, this will kind of increase the size of your bones without an epiphysis, for instance, your short bones, right? So epiphysis, we usually think of as long bones. Um, and so this will increase the size of short bones, right? Little, little stubby things, things that you're not basically walking on. And so it has a similar kind of an effect, right? So you basically have at that surface of the articular cartilage, you have your zone of resting cartilage. Um, and then ultimately when you reach your full size, again, there's a, a very significant, very complex cue in your body which says, okay, shut it all down. And then once you reach that full size, ultimately that is replaced by uh, that replacement is, is shut down. In this case, what's happening um, is you're shutting down the bone replacement. Remember, because this is articular cartilage, so you don't want to fill that in with bone. The idea is to give you a little bit of a, a padding on your bone so that you can buffer the wear and tear on the bone that comes with those load bearing joints. So in this case, instead of just shutting down the cartilage, you're also shutting down the bone replacement, so the bone deposition, because you don't want the bone to advance on that articular cartilage and fill it all in with bone. So you're telling the bone matrix, stop, right? Stop laying down bone because this piece is not for you. This piece of articular cartilage on the joint is not for you to turn into bone. So you have to stop there. And then this articular cartilage is basically what you're born with. And then ultimately it's what you're stuck with. So all the articular cartilage in the joints is basically what you originally developed and you keep it as such. Okay, now width, that is the girth growth. So ultimately when you take a look at width, the reason why you grow in width is purely for one reason, bone strength. Right. So essentially what you want to do is maintain load. So however much weight you intend to put on these bones is what you want to basically match. That's the goal there. So generally speaking, what happens is and it's very simple, right? Because we've already got the components already in there. And so when you take a look at the bone, you already have a periosteum wrapped around the bone. We already know that we have a connective tissue layer of the periosteum with a cellular layer of the periosteum just underneath. And so what happens then basically is the osteoblasts in the periosteum start to basically lay down bony matrix under 
the periosteum, which basically grows it outwards. So essentially what you have is you have your periosteum, you have your compact bone. So here's your cellular layer. I'm just going to draw like a little line here. And then in order to grow, what's going to happen is you're just basically going to lay down circumferential matrix around that. And you're going to keep adding that. And as you kind of keep adding that, it starts to grow outward. So you're just basically adding to that. And it starts to grow wider and wider and wider. So you're basically moving outward by just basically laying down this circumferential lamellae from your osteoblasts that are in your periosteum. And then of course you do the remodeling piece. So for instance, here you can see, this is the new bone right here on the outer edge. This is the old bone here. And so you just break all this old bone down and you've got the new bone to rest on. So you've just basically grown out in girth. And so that's basically how that works. And so the idea there is that you wanna get um, strength in your bones but remember um you don't want a lot you don't want a lot of bones because bony tissue bony matrix is expensive to make and so you just want enough to do the job and we'll take a look at that theme again a little bit later on so let's take a look at some things that are affecting bone growth so what goes into this well size and shape can be genetic right so there's definitely a bone mass genetic component associated with uh, people's bones. So like for instance, so uh, we always hear the term, uh, our family is big boned. Well, that may or may not be the case. That's a little bit of, um, um, how should we say, um, street lingo. That's just kind of like, you know, wives tale kind of stuff, right? Big bone usually is code word for we're just kind of, hefty <laughs> in our family, which typically doesn't have a whole lot to do with bone. But when you take a look at size and shape of bones in particular, it is, there is a genetic component. Now, it's not as variable as you would think, right? So it's not as variable from person to person as say other things like musculature and things like that. Mostly because we're all responding to the same thing. So when I was making my skeleton, I was making it for the exact same reasons and in response to the exact same environmental stresses as you guys were when you were making your skeleton. So as a result, our skeletons tend to be more similar than different. And we can see that in our skeletons, right? So there's not like, you know, oh, hey, look at this. This is like a gigantic femur, right? Versus, oh, this is a lily to bitty femur. It's not that variable. Why? Because we're all responding to the same environmental pressures, especially our gravitational field. Right, so that has a lot to say about our skeletal development. And so there is some genetic components to it in terms of how quickly we lay it down or how efficiently we lay it down. Uh, but also we have nutrition and hormones. We already talked about growth hormone as one of the hormones that will affect how you basically build your skeleton, but also nutrition, why? Because we already know that your bony matrix has calcium and phosphate in it. Right? That's part of the hydroxyapatite that cures the bony matrix to make it solid and hard. So we already know that there's a significant nutritional component. For instance, if you lack calcium um, during this growth and development, um, you can basically underdevelop your bones. Your bones can be somewhat small. And so sometimes people are diminutive, not necessarily because of genetics, but because of bad nutrition. They simply didn't have the kind of nutrition that they needed in order to support fully the type of skeletal growth that they needed. Um, one of the things that we'll have, uh, that we have need of nutritionally, not just calcium and phosphate, but vitamin D. Vitamin D is necessary for us because it allows us, it's a co-absorbent for calcium in the intestines. So in order to absorb calcium more efficiently, we have vitamin D as a co-absorbent that will allow us to be able to take in calcium more efficiently. Um, typically, we can either take it as a supplement. How many of you guys take a vitamin D supplement? Right, It's a good one to take, by the way. Right, There's a lot of benefits for vitamin D. 
It's also manufactured in the body, for instance. Basically, it is skin exposure to UV radiation, to sunlight, right? So vitamin D is one of those uh, nutrients that is uh, has a multi-step uh, process to its creation. It begins in the skin, which is the reason why we need to get sunlight. Um, and then it goes to the liver, goes to step two, and then it finishes off in the kidneys in the form of calcitriol, which will then basically uh, is the one that co-absorbs calcium in the intestines and it brings calcium into the intestines. If you don't have any vitamin D, typically you'll suffer from rickets, which is a skeletal deformation um, and just kind of like an abnormal skeletal development uh, symptom. If it's uh, during adulthood, it's osteomalacia, uh, where essentially you can oftentimes get softening of the bones because not bringing in enough calcium. Remember we did that experiment with hydroxyapatite. If you take out the calcium and the phosphate, you get rubber bones, right? And if you take out the organic piece, the collagen and all that sort of stuff, you get brittle bones. So you have to have both the inorganic and the organic components in your matrix in order to get functional bone. Well, that's what's happening here. Osteomalacia, basically you're getting softening of the bones. Why? Because you're removing calcium. That's creating that rubber bone effect. Okay. Vitamin C seems to be everywhere. It's involved in a lot of physiological processes, but basically this is necessary for collagen synthesis. So you can imagine that vitamin C deficiencies will affect not just bone, but this affects all connective tissue. Why? Because most connective tissues, whether you're talking about loose connective tissue or dense connective tissue or cartilaginous connective tissue or bony connective tissue, they all have one thing in common. They all make use of collagen in their matrix. So if you don't have vitamin C and you can't functionally synthesize collagen by either osteoblasts or chondroblasts or fibroblasts, depending on what type of connective tissue, connective tissue you're laying down, you're going to run into a world of hurt. Your connective tissue is going to be very weak throughout your body, not just in your bones. So if you have a vitamin C deficiency, that's scurvy, right? It's kind of the old pirate, right? The old scurvy dogs. Um, so this is basically when you have a deficiency of vitamin C. Um, and so oftentimes there's a lot of things that require vitamin C. For instance, blood clotting and wound healing requires vitamin C um, in order to actually get to blood to clot normally. So if you injure yourself or wound yourself, you're not gonna heal that quickly if you don't have vitamin C. Um, also, maintenance of your teeth, the root system of your teeth, the enamel system of your teeth, that's all vitamin C enabled. So your teeth just start to fall out because there's no vitamin C to help maintain the integrity of your teeth. So you can imagine then that there's a lot of downsides for some of these nutritional deficiencies, which is one of the reasons why we always make a big deal about eating a good nutritious diet, right? And also supplementing that not replacing that, but supplementing that good nutritious diet with supplements, a good broad spectrum supplement that will help kind of top off your body to make sure you have all of the good stuff, whether it's a D supplement or a C supplement or a multi supplement with just a lot of different things in there. That's always a good way to go. So the hormones that are affecting that. So we talked about uh, growth hormone, which is coming from the pituitary uh, gland. And so this will basically stimulate both interstitial and appositional bone growth. Um, typically, you'll also have interaction with the thyroid hormone as well, because the thyroid controls basal metabolic rates. And that's necessary for all tissues to grow, including bone tissue. Uh, reproductive hormones can have an effect on bones, for instance, estrogen and testosterone. We know that, right? Because testosterone, basically, this is the reason why we get bulk mass in male bones. So we typically take a look at the male body. It's typically a more massive body than the female body. That's, part, that's due to testosterone. 
part of that is the development of bone and skeletal muscle during puberty. This is the reason why little boys who are pre-puberty go from these little scrawny guys to by the time they're 18, they're just like, you know, there's this big hulking beasts, right? So that's because testosterone has been working along with growth hormone and other hormones on building that bone mass. And it's an aggressive bone mass producer, right? And also, of course, muscle mass as well. This is one of the reasons why athletes take it, why you take steroids, for instance, to increase muscle mass, but it also increases bone mass in males. And so um, this basically, the problem with this is it'll make your bones more massive, but typically it'll also close your epiphyseal plate. So this is kind of the downside of steroid use. This is the reason why you don't want teenagers to use steroids because they'll be short, right? Because it'll abnormally close off that epiphyseal plate. And so they will not reach their full potential height, right? Well, yeah, it's abnormal, right? Because basically what's happening is, I mean, you're, you're building bone mass. It usually goes more toward muscle mass. That's usually why we take it. Nobody really cares about bone mass, but it increases muscle mass. And with muscle mass, it also communicates with bone. So bone and muscle go together, right? So if you're lifting massive weights, that's a signal to your skeletal system to, to increase in mass. Um, and that's going to be tethered to your muscle system as well. But there's all kinds of side effects with testosterone, especially with the overproduction of testosterone. And I don't want to pick on testosterone because testosterone is, an, is the natural version of the male steroid. The steroids are basically manufactured spinoffs of testosterone, which have a lot of dark side to it, right? And those dark side are typically what we run into when we have athletes like suffering from side effects like brittle bones because there's an abnormal, my guess is what's happening in there is there's, uh, there's an abnormal, um, how should we say, kind of a destruction of the collagen or not as much of the collagen piece of the bony matrix being maintained relative to the calcium and phosphate. So it's becoming more brittle. It's going to that brittle bone stage. So there's an imbalance in the way the inorganic and the organic matrix is being laid down because typically you're perturbing the system artificially. Because remember, when you're taking steroids, when a man takes steroids, it's like the, the testosterone that's already in his body from his testicles doesn't go away, right? You add to that, and then basically you kind of create all these abnormal signals that then sort of transform the body. And so that's part of it. I mean, brain tumors is another one. So there's a lot of downsides um, to um, a lot of this. Um, which is the reason why most uh, sports, I don't know if there is a sport, hasn't, bans the use of steroids, right? So um, one of my favorite athletes who was a Denver Bronco originally, but then he came over to the dark side, to my Raiders, um, and was a crazy fool. Um, I don't know if you guys remember him, you Broncos fans, Lyle Alzado. Um, he was part of the Orange Crush era of the Broncos and he was just a crazy goon in Oakland. Um, and he took steroids um, and his body just became massive in the late eighties. And um, he ended up getting an inoperable event brain tumor. And that's what he died of. And that was, uh, they, they actually did figure that out. That was steroid induced uh, because of the steroids that he took. <laughs> Back in those days, they didn't regulate him. You can take as many as much as you want. But because of cases like that, and there's been many other cases in other sports like that, where steroids have basically killed people prematurely. It's the reason why uh, all the major sports pretty much bans the use of steroids is because the idea is like, listen, first of all, it's unfair because what about the guy who doesn't want to take steroids and kill himself? That's an unfair advantage, right? Uh, the other one is, listen, um, we're taking care of our players. We're not going to let our players kill themselves uh, to do this, right? So that's another, another component of it. So here's our gigantism. Here's our picture, right? The big tall dude, he's lucky he's not really that tall, so he doesn't need a cane. Um, and of course, you put him up next to the, the little guy, um, which is not an achondroplast. Um, 
that is achondroplasia because typically it looks like the features of that individual are in proportion with each other for the most part. They're just really tiny, right? Um, but there's a difference between achondroplasia and just diminutive size, like a pygmy, for instance, is an individual with normal body proportions, torso to leg and so forth. That's just very tiny, as opposed to an achondroplast, which has typically their a bit disproportion. So oftentimes the torso is a little bit longer, the legs are a little bit shorter. So they kind of get that, that little short legged um, look with a really long torso. Um, and so that's uh, kind of a different thing. So here you can see gigantism. So you have excessive growth hormone and then dwarfism or just the pygmy um, situation is just where you have less growth hormone. But the growth hormone you have is working normally. That's, that's how you, you're small, but you're in proportion is because the growth hormone that you get is making sure everything is constructed within normal proportions relative to each other. It's just that you don't have a lot of it, so you tend to be somewhat small. Whereas in achondroplasia, what happens is you get these abnormal administrations of growth hormone where some parts of the body kind of seem like they're trying to grow normally where other parts of the body are not. And so you kind of get this sort of contraction expansion effect across the body, which creates that um, sense of disproportion in some of the body, um, the body sizes right, relative to each other. So there's our pituitary giant and our pituitary non-giant, I guess. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, bone remodeling. Remember we talked about before, and I told you we we're gonna come back to it. Well, we're here again, right? Remember when we said that we had two different types of bone, we had woven bone and we had lamellar bone. And woven bone was the quick, cheap, dirty way to lay it all down. And then, lamellar bone was the good expensive final product, right? That was the way you want it. And the process of converting woven bone to lamellar bone is remodeling. And so oftentimes what happens is in order to do this, you have to break down the woven bone. <clears throat> and oftentimes when you lay it all down again, it'll change the shape, it'll make some adjustments. It allows you to be able to kind of finally configure the bone so that it is responsive to stress lines um, to make sure that your support is in the direction of the stress lines. Uh, we see it a lot in bone repair, especially in bone repair, um, but that's basically uh, where we see it. So whenever you're laying down new bone, it typically starts off as woven and then eventually it'll be remodeled into lamellar. So when you take a look at the mechanical aspects of a long bone in particular, right? This diaphysis, you'll notice first of all, a couple of things. Number one is it's a hollow cylinder. And so the reason why you only need a hollow cylinder is because it's lighter in weight. So a solid rod is gonna to be too heavy. Your bones, if they were solid, would be a massively heavy. A lot of what you would be lifting up, like when you just lift your leg up to take a step, the weight of your bones would require your muscles to be super massive in order to just basically pick up that extra weight of bone. And you don't need that. And not only that, but this hollow cylinder gives you what you need. You're not any higher if it were solid. You wouldn't be, uh, well, you'd be a, have a weight advantage because you'd be less weight, right? Any of you guys who are cyclists know that weight is a big thing, right? You want to get the bike that's really lightweight because you can go fast, right? The bikes that are really super heavy, I mean, plus your weight, you're pushing hard, right? You're working hard on that bike. And so you'd rather work less hard and go fast. And so you want a lightweight frame, like you want a lightweight frame for you. The composition is just as solid. As a, solid, as a solid rod, but you can basically support more weight without the bending component. So ultimately, when you take a look at the cylinder, the hollow cylinder, it gives you all the advantages that you want, right? So ultimately you have a reduction in weight and size 
and material. And not only that, but that, I mean, that compact bony outer, outer rid, rim with the hollow medullary cavity gives you all the support that you need in order to carry your body weight. And guess what? You don't have that much body weight because you've got this gigantic hollow cylinder with less material in there to have to carry. So this is what I was talking about when I said that the bone, you simply want enough material to do the job. You don't want to spend extra money making a hollow rod or it can be a solid rod because it's, a, it's just a waste of material. You're not going to basically make yourself stronger. If anything, you're just going to make yourself heavier and clunkier and it's going to be difficult to deal with. So when you take a look at the thickness of the edges of the bone, as the bone grows, it'll get thicker and thicker. And then oftentimes it's constantly going to be broken down and removed by osteoclast so that new bone can be formed, reformed by osteoblast. So basically what you have is this balance between osteoclastic activity and osteoblastic activity. The osteoclasts are constantly tearing your bones down. The osteoblasts are constantly laying down the new bone. Okay, and it's a balance between the two. So ultimately, your medullary cavity basically increases in size to keep your bones from becoming too heavy. So this is basically the hollow bone benefit. We don't usually think of ourselves as having hollow bones, do we? We think of birds that way, don't we? How many of you guys are aware that birds have hollow bones? Right, they have these really, really thin, hollow bones. And we usually think about that as like, well, this is an innovation of engineering, right? Because after all, you have to fly. So the last thing you want is this gigantic, like just this massively heavy thing. And you're like trying to flap your wings, trying to pull this massive weight up, right? So it makes sense that you have hollow bones as a bird because it lightens your weight so that you literally can just be gliding on the air. All you need is just a little bit of uplift from the air and it's just like a kite, right? A very lightweight kite just takes off, catches that air. So we think about birds as having hollow bones and that being an innovation of design. We don't think of ourselves as having hollow bones, but we do. And that's also an innovation of design because that basically saves us from the cost, the significant cost of having to produce more material in order to create that solid bone. By the way, that's before we get to the benefits of having that hollow medullary cavity in there where we can put bone marrow in there, right? We can basically thread a bunch of blood vessels in there. We can feed um, this very vascular area with all these different cells in there. And so that's before we even get to that part, okay? So when you take a look at bone remodeling, remember we're going from woven bone to lamellar bone. So ultimately what you end up getting is what's called these BMUs, these basic uh, multicellular units. And so um, actually, this is actually a good place to start because we're at our witching hour. And this will actually be a good review piece from bone remodeling so that we can kind of do a little bit of review before we dig into um, the mechanical stress idea. So we just kind of talked a little bit about mechanical stress on bones. We can kind of build that up a little bit, expand that discussion a little bit, but this would be a good place to start as a review point to review the stuff that we have gone over. We just sort of introduced a couple of those ideas. Then we can sort of review what those ideas were and then expand on those ideas. Um, and, then, and then kind of finish up that way. Does that make sense? You good? Okay. So, We will call that the end of that one.